So struct up is the, the way to define a CLI, but uh, really in the declarative way. So you're going to define every parameters uh, by putting their name, a type, and it will, uh, well, it almost work automatically. And as you would expect, so for example, here they use a, an option. It means that the parameter is optional. So you don't have to, to specify it. It will, it will work. Um, uh, if you if the user don't specify it and if the if it's not an option then the parameter is actually required and so you you have to specify it on the, the CLI. But I will show you a, an example in life so you will see um, and structured is actually using a clap clap is the like the main uh, library in rust to do a, a argument parsing well CLI um, this one doesn't work in a declarative fashion. You, ha you have to define, you have to create your object like at runtime and it works nicely. It's perfect. It's actually more flexible than strict opt, but it also means that you will have to, yeah, you cannot organize your things with structs more uh, easily like struct. You will have to, to parse it by yourself uh, at some point, so for example, um, here, you see that there is a definition for uh, in a parameter input and uh, later on when they want to use it, they have to take the value of input, uh, unwrap it. If it's a vector, they will have to do some treatment on it. Uh, so you have a bit more work to do before being able to, to use uh, that parameter. I, I will not show clap. Uh, if you are interested interested in that, you can check the uh, documentation. Yeah, I, I actually I wrote a question in the chat. I was asking what is the difference between using clap because I think in clap you can also define your parameters in the YAML file. Yeah, yeah there, there is technically really no difference in the sense that okay. struct is struct up is really using uh, clap uh, yeah. behind the scene. So it's it's really our only macro to generate all that code. Be, uh, okay, you, I see. All right. So. It's just that if you use clap directly, you have a bit more flexibility. There are things you cannot really do in Structot. Here you can do everything you want. All right, cool. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think first version, well, in old version of Substrate, we were using uh, clap actually, but. Yeah, yeah, it's using clap. Uh, yeah, with the YAML file. Yeah, that's another thing. So I saw it. we were using clap at some point. So then we switched to struct up because yeah, it's easier, but you will see that it's not also not uh, perfect. <laughs> so uh, I will show you an example with uh, struct up. Uh, so try. Yeah, I have a question, Cecile. Like I, yeah. I, yeah, I definitely understood, or at least mostly understood how like that struct sort of represents the structure of my command line arguments and options and everything. When I use struct opt to parse, you know, like whatever string a user types on the command line, does it give me back an instance of that struct, or is the struct really just declared like to declare the CLI? No, no, you get a, an instance of that struct. Okay. I will show an example here. So I'm going to initiate a new project and install struct opt. While it's compiling, so I'm I'm going to define my own uh, struct with my parameters. So I would say I don't know. Maybe we have a input file here, and that input file will be a string. Uh, I need to define that it's uh, structed. Okay. I have a slightly off topic question. It looked like you did cargo watch in that other terminal. That's going to like rebuild every time you save or something? Yeah. That's the. Oh, that's cool. Every time I change something, it rebuilds. And here I can display this thing. 
Cecil, I think you cannot deny that you like your mechanical keyboard. <laughs> I'm sorry, it makes a bit of noise. Though I, I picked the switch that does the less noise possible, but... It's okay, that's live. So I've made a command B here, and you see I've defined a parameter input file, which is a string. And because it's not an option, it, this parameter is not optional, I have to define it. So I will restart the command with the, par the value for a parameter, uh, no, slash C. and you see that uh, now it's printing the debug for my struct, because now my struct is really an instance, it's populated, and uh, the field is filled with the uh, value I've put in the argument, as you can see. Is it big enough on your screen, actually? It's, oh, yeah, it's even probably. smaller. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can read it. Uh, maybe I can increase. Oh, wait, I'm trying to shake if I can. I saw a few shaking hands, so it's okay for me, but I think you can maybe bump it up a little bit. Okay. Okay. Oh, that's great. Uh, yeah. That's bigger. Yeah. Better? Okay. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Thank you. Uh, so here I have defined an input file. It's a required argument, and uh, you see that the, the struct is uh, is instantiated. So I have the value in my uh, CLI instance. If I want to make it optional, I can just define it as an option. So now I I forgot to build it. So now if I start a command, you see it's none if I don't provide the argument but it's something if I provide the argument. So that's struct up. It's, re it's really handy. So this you is know, a positional argument, I guess, right? Like you didn't have to do dash dash input file or, yeah. or whatever, okay, yeah. To define, a, and that's a, the cool thing with struct up, to define it as a, as a parameter, you can actually use uh, this. And now if I start it, yeah, if I start it, of course it works, but here I've changed and now it's a, it's an argument. I have to specify it with input file. And you see that it's actually converting the name automatically for me. So in Rust it's input file with the underscore, so it's a snake case, but here it's converted, it's converting automatically the underscore to the dash. Yeah, and it looks like it gave you, I guess dash H is going to just print that same information we saw, and it also gave you dash V for version that just comes with struct opt. Yeah, version guess, help is ultimately defined for you. And if you want to provide a, a documentation here, you can use the doc string directly. Like this. And you see it appear automatically. So that's very handy. So you follow for for here? <laughs> uh, nobody has a question? All good. Okay. Yeah, it seems like it makes sense so far. Yeah, it's really Okay, so now I'm going to show you the, the tricky part is that uh, strict up is actually the, useful when you have a binary. It's really made to make to be used in binaries, not, not really in libraries. So here, if I want to put a default, for example, uh, on my value, um, it's not. with the default value, I forgot. Yeah, that's default value. Uh, so if I don't insert any argument here, I will get the default value that is defined here. And in Substrate, we have uh, we are, we are using strict opt, but it means that we cannot use that default value because if we define the default value uh, in Substrate, it means that the application that is going to use SCCLI 
will not be able to uh, redefine that value. So we will see how to, to change that. Well, but I, I will first show how it works on the, on the SE, uh, CLI. So you're, you're saying substrate is sort of special and a little bit different than this example you just did because it's not really, it's more of a library, like I'm supposed to use yeah, it. Yeah, it's, it's a, uh, yeah, normally it's true up you use that in a, in a binary, not in a library. So that's yeah. why some things are, are a bit more, more difficult to express uh, with uh, SCCLI. Yeah. But, so I'm going to show you the documentation for the um, newest, the latest API of, C, of uh, SCCLI, which is using a, a thread CLI configuration. And uh, you will see how it works. So uh, that's for the documentation. So we have this uh, Substrat CLI. So that's a thread that you're going to, def to define on every application you want to make. And uh, it will return a few information that are useful for uh, defining the CLI, uh, like the implementation name, the version, uh, etc. And you also need to define the load spec at this level. And um, this thread will also provide from arcs exactly like struct up does. So, but we're, we're going to see how it works on the node template or on the, the actual code. Okay. Yeah. So I wanted to just ask a little bit about the versioning while you're getting set up here. So I, I know like as we're leading up to Substrate 2.0, things change sometimes and, and everything. So recently we've had the fortunate situation of having an alpha released every couple weeks to a month or something. Um, and so I think the latest one is alpha five and you, I actually, I think Cecile, you had some big overhaul to the CLI that went into alpha five and then another big overhaul since yeah. then it's like on master, but not like it'll be in alpha six whenever we get that. Hopefully yeah. right. so so the, okay. the one I'm going to show here is for the alpha six. Okay, cool. Um, so I took the example for the UTXO and, um, here we define our CLI uh, like this, so just like you would do for normal struct opt. So you define a, a struct uh, CLI. Uh, you define a subcommand. If you want to be able to reach the subcommand of substrate, you will need those subcommand, those subcommand that come from uh, SCCLI. And if you want to run the node, of course, you need the uh, run CMD uh, that also come from uh, SCCLI. And when you have those those two things, you can you can actually already build your CLI because uh, the subcommand uh, means that you that if there is a subcommand, it will be you can run it. And if and for, if you don't have a subcommand, the fact that it's optional means that the subcommand will be known. So it will be the, it will be uh, understand that you are trying to run the node. And here you, you see we use uh, struct up flatten, which is an attribute that allows you to uh, to uh, take all the argument of a struct and use it in your struct directly. So for for I mean for development it doesn't change anything. You still need to to go to run to get the the attribute, the fields, and everything. But uh, uh, from uh, from the user perspective, it's it's uh, different because you can use, um, I'll show you here. It means that all the arguments that are in RENCMD, all of these are in RENCMD, will come from, uh, well, will be direct, directly accessible without the command run. I'm not, I'm not sure if I explained that <laughs> properly. Uh, do you understand? Or? Yeah, I think I get it from just familiarity with substrate nodes, but let me actually make sure it's the thing that you're talking about the thing I think you are, which is like, when I run a substrate binary, I can do lots of things like substrate purge chain to purge the chain yeah. or like, um, what's another one like uh, build spec to build a chain spec yeah. or whatever. And then there's one that's sort of special, which is the run command. And it's special because we don't have to do like substrate run and then whatever arguments, like if you omit the sub command entirely, then you get run by default. That's the thing yeah. you're talking about, right? That's it, yeah. 
And then like, I think I just learned this, but from you, like, let me make sure I got it. Like, because we did flatten above the run command, then that means that like, so there's all these options that go with the run command. Like, I think it's the ones you're showing, right? Dash, dash, Alice and dash, dash, Bob. Yeah. And so yeah, because you did flatten, you can specify those like directly on the substrate binary, even without the run command. Yeah, yeah. that's the thing. Yeah. Or if I didn't put the flatten, it means that uh, run will be a subcommand itself and you would mm -hmm. need to type run in front of the options. Yeah, so, so one thing that like I've struggled to wrap my head around is like, um, like I totally understand why people might wanna not have to type run and, and all that stuff, but like, let's assume I'm using one of the other subcommands that is an actual subcommand like purge chain, for example. Does structopt understand that if I'm not using run, then I can't use like dash dash Alice or like any of these flags that go with the run command or how, how does that part work? Uh, well, uh so by default, what will happen is that if a subcommand is provided, all the uh, parameters that are inserted in the command line will be used for that subcommand and not for the run CD. Okay, I see. I see. So, so if I uh, were to do like... Substrate. That's something we defined uh, on substrate. Um, so. Yeah, okay, okay. So like if I explicitly specify a subcommand like purge chain, then any additional flags that I supply are going to be applied to that purge chain command. And like, you know, if I choose one of these ones that doesn't go with purge chain, then I'm just going to get like the parsing error or whatever, like yeah. you showed. Okay, cool. Great. The run CMD is a bit uh, the exception. That's why uh, it's, a, it's a bit annoying to define, but that, that's how it works you now. Um, but it's all, the, the reason why we do it like this is also because we want to be able to run uh, the node without typing the, the subcommand run itself. So it's it's just a shortcut, you know. But because it's a, it's a nice shortcut for the user, it's, it's also a bit annoying for us to, to define. <laughs> so it means that when we're going to parse the command line, we will have a CLI object. Uh, with a field subcommand that can be some or none. And if it's something, that it means it's a subcommand. But if it's none, it means that we are in the run CMD case. Um, uh, I will just show you. So that's the, the basic to define a, a subcommand, really. It's a, a, sub a CLI with substrate. But now I'm going to show you for uh, UTXO, we have uh, arguments that we want to add actually to the to the node when we run it. Can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, what you said before. Um, so can you go back to that initial defini definition again, where run command and sub command? Yeah. So if and like uh, what I don't understand is how is this struct CLI implying that you can be either in subcommand or run, you know, because that's that's what you said it happens. If there if subcommand is sum of something, then we completely ignore the second thing. No, it's not really ignored entirely. It's uh, well, it's not used, but uh, you will have default values in the in the struct. Okay. So but the parameters provided by the user will be given to, to parse the subcommand, not, not to run CMD. Okay. This is like a contract, which I guess it's like somewhere, yeah, it's like a, our own sort of contract of how we define our CLIs. Yeah. To me, it's not, uh, uh, because it's kind of complicated to, to understand, I would, I would have preferred that everything would be a command and we use run command with the command run. That, that would be much easier actually to define. But uh, since uh, uh, people preferred to have this shortcut where you can not type the word run and it will work, then I had to define it uh, in struct way Instruct up in some way, and uh, the struct up way to define this is actually to to pass an argument subcommand that is optional. So you can say, okay, there is a subcommand or there is no subcommand, 
and the rest of the arguments will be taken for the the case where there is no subcomment. Okay, thank you. Oh, I okay, yeah. That makes more sense. So I have an, I have another question for you. Is it possible as someone who's building on top of substrate? So like, let's say, you know, I'm just building my node. I don't have any intention to actually like hack the substrate code or, or change it or anything like that. Is it possible for me to simplify my own node by eliminating this like, you know, run is its own special? Like, can I, can I make run not special? Can I require my users yeah. to type it? Or is that something that's like, at the substrate level, that decision's already been made and we're either use it or like, you know, change substrate. Uh, no, no, uh, well, all the subcommands are defined for you and run CMD also. Here in this case, it, I've added a, a parameter, so that's why we have uh, some kind of wrapper that I'm going to explain. But normally, if you want a simple case, it will look like this. If you don't redefine anything, it will look like this and it, that just works. Yeah. Okay, cool. So that's, that's pretty simple, right? I'm, what I'm wondering now is like, is it possible for me or like you in this node to, um, to even like simplify this more by saying like, we don't want this shortcut where the user doesn't have to type run or like, it's just part of substrate that that's in there. Uh, that's part of substrate. You, yeah, you okay, can't cool. really change it easily. Okay, cool. Nice. So this simple one you're showing now, this is probably what it looks like in like the node template, I guess, for example. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, nice. And then the the slightly more complex one you had before was because like in preparation I had asked you like, oh, what does it look like to add a um what do you even call that? Like a flag, I guess, or an argument or something? Yeah, a command line argument. Huh? So yeah. argument. So but I'm I'm going to show uh, how it's done. So in the service uh we have those methods, uh, new full and new light. And normally what you get in parameters is always the configuration. And uh, you build your service based on that. But what we want here is to add a new parameter. We want something new in the configuration. Uh, you cannot extend the configuration uh, like that. So what you can do instead is provide your extra parameters in argument to the to the function. So here I've added the uh, the uh, public key in argument of the of the function, and that key will be used uh, by the service. So here it's it's uh, creating a full service. Uh, so it's using the key uh, when it builds uh, the providers. Where is it? Yeah, here. So in the end, the parameter ends up being used by the by the service. So that that's how you would like to to do if you want to to add a parameter from the CLI. First, you, you make sure that your service can be built with that parameter, and it's literally a parameter. It's just an argument to the to the function. So, that, so I wanted to see if we could get just some context on like this service.rs file that we're looking at. I've talked about it on seminar before, but I think it's one of the like less well understood parts of Substrate, especially if like the main thing you're doing on Substrate is like building your time. Not everybody's totally familiar with this service file. So like, is it correct that this is the file that basically like wires together all the parts of your outer node, like the non runtime parts? Um, actually, yes, that's, that's the role of the service. Well, that's the role of the client in general. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. And so like, I, I know in a lot of them, um, there's like, there's two functions in here, new full and new light. And they, that's the ones you were showing that take that config parameter, I guess. Right. Or yeah. co configuration maybe. Yeah. So um, configuration. And so that one comes from Substrate itself, and it has like a ton of useful stuff that you'll probably want to use. Like I know there's options about disabling grandpa and like which, you know, maybe you have a list of specific peers you want to connect to or like peers you don't want to connect to. And yeah. telemetry. like just a ton of really useful stuff that like many nodes are going to want. And then the context for what we're looking at right here is that 
Um, since we were working on this proof of work node, we wanted, we wanted to do what Bitcoin does, which is like whoever mines the block ends up getting the reward for the block. So like, uh, you know, some, some new tokens or whatever. And that particular option for like, you know, okay, you know, miner, like what is your address or public key or whatever, that is not part of the default configuration struct because it was designed with like proof of uh, stake in mind more. And yeah. so what you've done now is I guess just added this second parameter here, right? Yeah, that's it, yeah. Yeah, cool. So I was like, the other day I was sort of misguidedly asking questions on the various forums, like, hey, how can I extend this configuration struct or like add my own fields and it looks like the answer is don't don't do that just add additional yeah, yeah. the thing with uh, with rust is that it's not really a op you know so you you know when you want to to add something to a struct you don't you you wrap the struct to another struct but you don't try to change things inside the struct so that's why it's easier actually to to pass the uh, the value uh, my argument to the function yeah, cool. Makes sense. Um, so that's uh, how it works to, uh, to add a, an argument at the service level. So you try to, to add an um, argument to, you, to your function calls. And then when you want to, to actually get that argument from the, the CLI, um, yeah, uh, I didn't want to open that file yet. Uh, you have to 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 define it some way so here what i've done for um for this project is uh i'm wrapping the run cmd command so you see that uh, run cmd is used here and i wrap it in an, another strict that is also called uh, run cmd and i i'm going to use strict up flatten to make sure that the arguments are directly accessible for the from the command line so all the argument that you would use to run a node are directly accessible uh, when you when you try to run uh, this one. Uh, and when I have done that, it means that I can add new argument and they will be parsed like if they were on the same level. So uh, I've added here the, the public key and it's going to be on the same level than any argument of the SC CLI uh, run CMD. So that's how you can actually uh, uh, extend run CMD by wrapping run CMD in uh, another struct and then adding new fields to, uh, to that struct. So if you look uh, here on the help of the command, you can see that uh, most of the arguments are from, uh, from run CMD itself, so from substrate, but this one has been added by us uh, using this trick here. This command flag is trying to let the user specify like, you know, not just a string or something like that, but like actually a fairly elaborate data structure or in general, like it could be. So how do you actually do the parsing? Is that this, I guess it's that function at the bottom there, right? Yeah, so that's more like, uh, that's more something of strict up. So I'm going to, to show the documentation of strict up here. And um, if you look at custom string parsers, you see that you can actually de define your own function to parse uh, the object. So here we want to have uh, a public key. And to parse that, uh, what I do is that I'm going to define my own parser. So here you see that I, I put an argument parse. Uh, using the try from str and then the function name that is uh, here. And it will use that function to try to parse uh, the string and transform it to the, to the public key. Uh, normally it's, it's usually something simpler to do, you know, here for example, that they parse a single uh, hexadecimal digit. So yeah, they just parse it that way to a U32 and it's uh, quite, quite fast. But uh, for our case, it's a bit more complicated because they are like uh, 32 bytes. Uh, so if I translate that to hexadecimal, it's uh, 64 uh, digits. So I first need to decode 
that 64 digits to uh, an array of, uh, of bytes. So that's what this line is doing. And uh, yeah, the rest is, uh, is just converting error. And the last one is uh, to convert the, the array of bytes to uh, the actual public key. So here it's, it's it's a bit more complicated because it's uh, also a custom type that we have, you know. So this one, I see this one you've marked as option, which we talked about before, but there's no default here. So does that mean like, uh, oh yeah, default, yeah. So if we don't supply it, we just get none, I guess, right? In the yeah. Struct? Yeah, okay, cool. And then like, it's up to, I guess, the service or wherever this thing gets passed into to like handle the situation where that option is none. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, cool. So the struct will, will just have none. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to show that uh, also a bit later. So I'm, I'm showing this example here because I think it's uh, uh, the most important one on how to, to extend and art, add arguments. And, and then I will explain how uh, and why it's done like that. Uh, so I've, I've got a question. Yeah. So for the configuration struct, in Rust 140, there was a, um, a feature that was added called non-exhaustive, where like if you want to add fields in the future, you could tag your struct or enum with this. Would it make sense to tag the configuration struct as non-exhaustive so you can add fields in the future? Um, actually, I don't know. What feature is it that you said? Uh, yeah, I can send a link if you give me a sec. I think I might be able to answer this, yeah. but not, not in a very detailed way. But so yeah, but no understand it, non-exhaustive is meant for the binary compatibility of structs. So if you wanted to, like, so if you had a struct, um, for example, run command in the substrate library, and you wanted to distribute the substrate library as a as a dynamic library. And then you wanted to sort of swap out that that library and like have it provide a new struct run command or something. Then the non-exhaustive thing would allow you to have a different struct with more fields, sort of in that new dynamic library. So it's not about it's not about the the code side or the command line argument parsing side. It's about the binary compatibility of the struct, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I, 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 to be honest, I have really no idea about this feature. So, I, but I, I trust you're right. Yeah, it seems like a cool feature. It has lots of good emoji reactions. <laughs> it's always like that with the Rust community. They're often yeah. very enthusiastic. <laughs> so yeah, it's hard to just uh, extend a, a struct like that. So th that's why here we we're wrapping uh, the struct. Um, so that's how we can define a new uh, parameter for the CLI. And now we need to pass that parameter to the, the function. But before I, I show you how to do that, maybe I will explain first uh, how it works um, to uh, run a command or run the node with the, the latest API. So, uh, in this API, uh, the goal is that we need to create a configuration. I'm going to find the code. Uh, so the goal is that we need to create a configuration that we're going to pass to a, to a function uh, for our node. And um, we need to, to create that configuration without um, without having uh, default values uh, everywhere. So what I mean by that is that, for example, you have, uh, uh, what do we have? Uh, we have a, a dev flag, but that flag is not, uh, it's a required flag. So we need to, this flag to be defined and we, do, we don't want to create a, a temporary object that will be filled uh, later on. So what, what, it is, what I mean by that is that what it is doing is that we, we, we parse the arguments and from that arguments, we will 
transform the object to a configuration when we run the command or, or when we run the node. Uh, okay, there's... so that line uh, like five above where you are right now, let CLI equal, that's the line that actually does, um, like that's the thing that actually parses the, the CLI and gives you back that, that struct that contains the options? Uh, parsing the CLI itself is done here when you, okay. when you yeah. really parse it from the, the arcs. And then you have this uh, CLI object, so you have your strict object that you want to transform somehow to the, the configuration. And that is done actually by, by this line here, where we, uh, we create a runner for that command here. Uh, so what it's going to do is that it, it will take the CLI argument that have been parsed. So you see I pass, I use a CLI dot, so it will, it will be based on that. Mm -hmm. And I will create a runner uh, from that. And a runner is actually uh, an object of uh, Substrat CLI that will uh, that will have the configuration and also uh, an instance of the the, the async engine that you, we're going to use. So here it's Tokyo. So we will have also an instance of Tokyo in that object. Okay, cool. So, so that, so I get what CLI is. That's like the struct that we got from parsing our args. And then it has dot create runner. Like, does that create runner method just come? Like, does every struct opt struct have that, or is that more of a? No, no, that's really specific to to a substrate. Okay, so what did we? Where did we? Like, uh, did we? Does CLI implement some trait or something, or like, how did it end up with this create runner method attached? Uh, that's uh, in the new API. So we have this new object, uh, this new thread called Substrate CLI. Oh. Okay. Uh, I showed it uh, here. Uh, here. So um, so that's uh, that's the new thread you need to define on every binary, every application you're going to 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 build. And it's 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 used is to replace the version of info of the the old APIs. Yeah, okay, I see. And so this is like one of the, that create runner is like a provided method on this trade. Uh, so, so you get this uh, create runner method and that allows you to, to, to start uh, the, uh, the node or start the uh, sub command. And uh, to define uh, the substrate CLI thread, you will need to, to implement all the methods and, uh, but there are shortcuts to help you implement them. So for example, for the impl name, well, you can do much. So you have to, you have to define a, a string for the implementation name, but for the version, for example, in the latest uh, CLI API, you can actually use the environment, the build environment variable, substrate CLI in per version. And that environment variable is the full version of your application. It's the, the version from the cargo.toml uh, with the um, architecture of your computer, the environment, uh, the, um, the commit hash of, the, of your repository. So it's, it's really the full version. And uh, in the previous version, we didn't, we didn't have that. So we, you had to define the, the commit and the version separately. But here it's doing everything at once uh, with that environment variable. And uh, to get that environment variable, you will need to use the build script, uh, the build script of, of Substrat CLI. So if you go to, um, oh yeah, I, I will show on the, this project here, it will be easier. Uh, so here we have uh, UTXO. <coughs> If I go to node, you see that I have a build.rs file. And in that build.rs file, I'm going to use the, the method generate cargo keys. And that one is going to provide you the, the full version of your application. So the environment variable that we saw. And before you had to use Vergen, but uh, now with the new API, you don't need Vergen anymore. In your dependency, you can just use that one and and it's good. You know. Well, if you want to customize, you can still use Vergen and 
do it yourself, you know, it's, but otherwise you can just use this handy environment variable and, and it will do the, the job for you. Um, I, I'm going to continue on the UTXO because here it's a similar code. So the version is automatically uh, provided with that, with that environment variable. Then you have the uh, executable name. Um, normally with Structop, it's going to take cargo PKG name. And here for, uh, for some reason, well, that are a bit complicated to explain, but we need a static string. So uh, you need to, to define this, uh, this function and you can provide any name you want, but usually what you would want is the cargo PKG name. Um, you have the, the author, that's if you want to pick the one from cargo to the Toma also, you can use that uh, environment variable. Uh, description, so nothing special. Then you have the support, support URL. All of that come from really is the same than the version info that we had before. It's, it's nothing different. Um, we have the copyright start here, and at the end we have the load spec. So the load spec it used to be in a, in the chain spec file, and uh, it it didn't change much. The the only difference is that it has this uh, this self argument in in the parameter, and uh, yeah, there is really no difference about that actually. So, so when you have what is the yeah. load of what does that load spec file or function do? Uh, so it's cool to um, to load the spec based on the argument of the CLI. So when you when you define the so for example um, yeah the, I think it's the dev flag that does that. So when you use um, the dev flag mm -hmm. uh, the ID that you will get here will be uh, different. It will be the, the dev ID. Yeah, okay. And if you if it's not uh, I think you can also provide the file of the chain spec directly. Um, yeah, I know there's this dash dash chain argument, is that the one you mean? Like it's this function is Yeah, correct. right. That's the one. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Oh, so this function is where that uh like value takes effect. Well, it's used here, but it's not, uh, yeah, you, you can still override it actually uh, before that. Okay. But yeah. Cool. So it's used here for the ID. And actually, if it's a file, because you can put it a file, and then you, you go to that, uh, to that branch of the match where it loads the file, the JSON file, instead of the, uh, of the, or of the dev or car or staging key. So that's uh, the difference. It's a bit more verbose because you have to define a, an implementation for a threat, but it's also a bit easier because you don't have to pass it around. You know, you define it once, but then you see you do, you don't provide it anywhere. It's it's already in there in the object. So. There is no need to pass it everywhere. Um, I don't know. Do you have a, does anyone have any question? I think I'm, I think I'm getting it so far. I wonder if um, like, if we want to do an example, I know at some point you talked about like adding a parameter for that. Yeah. Um, that number of rounds that we have in the mining or like, you know, we, you and I had an interesting error when, before we made the, um, like that minor public key an option. So I don't know if you wanted to show that or something. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah I will just show you one last thing. It's, uh, uh, I know maybe I can do that later actually. Okay, so let's try the, the other example. So in the UTXO we have this, uh, argument 
for the rounds. What is the rounds actually? Yeah, I can, I can. Yeah, so it's interesting, like, Cecilia, from your perspective, it didn't really matter what that was. You just knew that we could make it yeah. into like, a command line parameter, right? Um, yeah. For, yeah, I guess for full context, like, in the way that the proof of work algorithm in Substrate works is that you specify this number of rounds. And so when your node goes to try to mine a new block, it'll try, in this case, like 500 different nonces. And if it finishes 500 nonces and still hasn't mined a block, then it, you know, it like pauses and comes back to check like, okay, have we imported any other blocks from other miners? And then if not, it'll go back and try for another 500 rounds. So tuning this it basically allows you to say like, okay, if you make it a high number, you're saying you want your node to be like heads down mining on your own blocks, not hardly listening to other ones on the network. And if you set it to a no low number, it's like, let's do a good job listening for other blocks to come in and, uh, you know, not waste time mining on our own if other good ones are in there. Mm. So that's basically what the parameter's for. And you tune that depending on the power of your machine in that case? Yeah, I, that, I'm sure that affects it. I'm not really good enough at running these kinds of nodes to know in practice how one would want to set that value. <laughs> I stole this one from 500 was what it was in Kalupu, so. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so here, it, it, for me, it was easy to see because it's a like hard-coded value in the function. So I knew that uh, we can parameterize it if you want. So what we want here is that uh, this thing become a parameter. So instead of being defined here, we will say, okay, I want to, to have a parameter here. Uh, I have no idea what type it was. Oh, let's say U32, we'll change it later if it's not. Yeah, I'm sure uh, Rusty would tell us if it's something different. Yeah. <laughs> it's a uh, compiler driven development, right? <laughs> so uh, I'm going to pass it in argument instead of uh, passing it by, uh, well, or instead of arguing it. So I, I, I start here from the end because I know it, it's something that we need to, to pass. But then I will go back to the beginning and edit the CLI file. So the CLI file, it's usually the place where you're going to define your strict opt and nothing else. No code, no, no logic if you can. Well, here we, we put the parcel because there is no choice, but ideally you don't you want to have the minimum amount of code here. And uh, so what we want is to add a new parameter for the rounds. Uh, um, just So this parameter needs to be optional, and I will explain later why. Maybe I should compile to see what type is it, because <laughs> I will copy paste U32 everywhere, but it's maybe not that. So here the, the parameter is defined. The, I put also a, a doc string, so it can be, um, it has a nice help for the user. Uh, I just pass the word uh, long because it's a parameter. It's not a, uh, it's not a positional argument. We want it to, to have a full name. Otherwise, it, it, it has to be used like, uh, you know, I, I, uh, we don't have a case, but you need to use it at, as an, an argument, a positional argument instead like this. But we, want, we don't want that. We want to have it with uh, the flag. You know. Well, it's not a flag, but the uh, parameter syntax. Okay. So here it's defined on both uh, way. I'm going to build it to see if it works a bit. Cecile, right now in our, our current state, we've basically like, we've told struct opt that we want to parse this additional parameter for yeah. rounds. And we've also told our service, like our new full function that creates the service, like, hey, you should expect another parameter called rounds. But what we haven't yet done, I kind of want to know if this is correct. Like yeah. what we haven't yet done is wired that value that we parsed. Yeah, so exactly. That function. Okay, cool. And that will happen in the, co the command that are as far. So in the CLI file, we define things, but in the command file, we, we wire things. And at the end, in the service file, we, uh, well, we create our, our service. So we actually use the value. Um, 
So here uh, it's compiling almost. So it says, okay, now we have a new argument. We have three parameters instead of two. Um, so I will simply go and add uh, this new parameter. So um, wiring things. Uh, 79 here is the new foo. So we need to pass the runs. And to extract the runs from the commands, it's it's kind of easy because you actually have the struct CLI here. So you can access your value directly. Like this. Uh, no, it's not like this. Actually. So run and then run. Yeah, okay, so that makes sense. Like CLI is the struct we got from struct opt, and then the dot run is because this was a flag that we added to the run subcommand, I guess. Yeah. And, uh, and it's called rounds just because that's what you called the field in your struct, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. And then like, so this is, I think the question I'm about to ask is kind of a Rust noob question, but like I'm kind of a Rust noob, so I'll just ask it. Um, like, I saw code like this before and I was like, ooh, I can simplify this. Instead of doing let rounds equal, like I can just put cli.run.rounds right down there in the, where we're calling new full. And I, something borrow checking related didn't like that. So like what exactly is happening there on line 75? Are we like cloning or copying rounds or how does that well, Actually in that case, uh, nothing because I, I could actually put runs, I could put the code directly in the argument of the function. I'm just extracting it, uh, extracting it earlier because it's clearer to, well, it's better for reading, that's all. Um, At some point I was doing something really similar and it didn't, it didn't like that. Yeah, it's possible that the board checker uh, complained. That's, but I don't have an example here, I think, for that particular case, because I think those here it will just work in both cases. The only thing here that we that is not working, if you look at the the log, try to put the log in full screen. Yeah, is that the the type is actually um, expecting a U32, but we have the option of U32, so we we need to provide the default value. So the default value here that we want is uh, 500. That's the the value that was uh, encoded or art coded before. So yeah, the, the only reason here I'm, I'm separating it's just to, to, to do things in two steps, you know, have first extract, process the arguments, and then uh, push it to the function that will actually use it. Yeah, I think especially now that we are doing the like unwrap or it makes it a lot cleaner to have that as two separate lines. Yeah. Before it was just run, so it was fine, but otherwise it, it can the length the line can be very long. Yeah. Okay, so now it's already compiling, so I, I think it's already done actually. We we just met that uh, that parameter already. So I'm going to check um, with the dash dash help argument. And you can see that the runs, yeah. They are here. Yeah, cool. So we can actually define. I, I don't think we will see it on the on the screen, right? Uh, yeah, I don't think there's any logs that are going to tell us or anything. But uh, the fact that it's running is a good sign. Yeah, we could add some log to to show the value before running the node. So you see that with the new API, it's quite easy and the pattern is always the same. So it's, well, in any case, it's always the same is that you have this strict up object uh, and you want to transform it to the configuration object. Um, yeah, and like, and I guess in this case, so like you transform it to the configuration object and then like in this case, potentially add some additional parameters that you're taking. Yeah. So that's the way to add new parameters, but there is also a way to uh, change the default value. Because as, as you have seen uh, with strict up, normally the default value, you put it in the, in, the, 
in the declaration, in the definition of the uh, destruct. But if we did that in substrate, it means that when we would want to override it in the binary, it wouldn't be possible because uh, yeah, <laughs> the default value would be in the substrate and we cannot transform the struct that is already defined in the substrate. So what we did in substrate is that every value that has, um, every field that has a, a default value um, is an option. So like we did here, we used option instead and we let actually the, the the function that transform the struct up to a configuration object define what's the default value. So it's possible to operate things. Uh, I wanted to show an example that, um, well, here we can do, for example, uh, override uh, the dev flag. Mm. Uh, let's say that the the dev flag will be true by default instead of false by default. So to do that, we we will do do exactly the same way. We would uh, we need to to wrap the run cmd command like we did here. So everything is actually already done almost. All we need to do now is to define the way that this run cmd will be transformed into a uh, configuration object. If you look at the command, you will see that uh, right now, that, that's the line, it's uh, important. Right now to, to do that, we use run.base. And run.base, we're just taking the object as it is, we don't transform it. And uh, the configuration object is made based on that alone. But if we want to, um, to uh, redefine how the flag will behave, we will need another thread. Um, I will show you the thread, the CLI configuration thread. And that's the thread that actually transform uh, an object, any object, it can be struct up, it can be anything, to a configuration object. Um, So I'm going to implement CLI configuration for uh, run CMD, but our run CMD, not, uh, not the one of SC CLI. So the one from SC CLI has this trade implemented already, I guess. Yeah, right? okay. that's it. So here I'm going to import it from our thing. Okay, I'm going to save, save like that and see what this, uh, Maybe, ooh, I open window too much. And you see that the only function that you need to make this uh, thread work is the shared parents. And that that function, it's the there there are a few functions for parameters that are defined that are defined auto, that defines automatically the parameters for you. So if if you have, for example, um, a run CMD. Well, any command has the shared params. It's the one that, it's the params that has uh, the log, where to log things, and or, uh, the chain spec also, I think. Uh, yeah. So what we want here is to get the, the shared params object from the parent object. So I'm going to define shared params. So, is it that? I, th I think it's already that actually. So this implementation you've done and now is sort of basically like the, a trivial one. Like if, if this compiles, then we're gonna go in and do the actual override that you were talking about. Yeah. Okay, cool. So the shared params is really where you have all the common params for all the commands. So you need to define that one. The other are optional, but that one is required. Voila. And now we can override things. So if you look at CLI configuration, 
that method is required. We need to define it. Uh, there are default implementation for the other params, for the import params, running params, uh, network params. We need to define those for NCMD. So I will do them also, uh, but not right away. What what I want to show is uh, how to override uh, is the flag. So normally, uh, this one is defined by uh, the default implementation of this one is to to use the shared params to take the value of the the dev flag that the user provides in argument. But what we want to do here, for example, is to override this value. So I can say um, I can enforce, for example, the dev mode like that. And that means that no matter what the user will provide an argument, it will be always dev mode. Okay, so I, I, I think I'm starting to get this idea, like the, the examples we did previously were, were strictly adding flags. Like we were saying there's something in, or yeah. there, there's nothing in the configuration that does what we want, let's add one. Yeah. But this example is different because we're saying like there actually is something in the configuration for this, we just want to do it differently than the default. Yeah, here we want to, to override the default value actually. Yeah. So this is kind of a funny one. This is going to mean it's, it's, it runs in dev mode whether we specify the dev flag or not, right? Yeah, it doesn't make much sense in that case, though. I think we have uh, one command that does that, uh, the one for the benchmark, I think. Um, but what you would usually do is to override the port, uh, the RPC port or uh, yeah. Okay. yeah, something more sensible. So is this the, the proper way? Oh, so like if I wanted to provide a default RPC port, like I know there is one, I think it's like 9944 or something, but like, let's say for whatever reason, you know, like uh, Joshy Chain wants a different default port, like this is how I would do that? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Oh, cool. You would need to override, uh, yeah, one of the methods that, that provide this port. Ah, those two already in the WMS. HTTP, and there is another one. Or, yeah, it looks like I think RPC WS probably. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah one last thing is that uh, defining CLI configuration is is nice, but you must not forget to pass the the parent object and not the the object that is wrapped. Otherwise, it's not used. Oh. So here we have defined CLI configuration for our run CMD. So th that's the that's the implementation that is going to be used uh, in here. Yeah, cool. Uh, I will just show what happened if you don't provide the CLI configuration implementation. Uh, actually, it's nothing really special. It's just that this function really requires the, the thread to be implemented. So if I delete this, so if I have no implementation for CLI.run, it will complain. Oh, so, okay. So dot base is the one that already has that trait implemented. You can just use it out of the box, but then the yeah, idea is like if Because that's the run CMD from a CCLI. Oh, base. I, did, I didn't understand where that, that base was coming from. That's what we called it here in this struct. Yeah. Yeah, got That's it. That's a wrapped object. Understood. We, we could call it any way we want. doesn't matter. It's not visible to the user anyway, so. Yeah, right. Okay, that's cool. Wrapped. Yeah. So here, if you want the default implementation that we need to take a uh, base, yeah, or I think it's called wrapped now. Uh, no, I, I canceled. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So, Cecile, I'm curious if you want to do either of these or something different. Like, we've got like 15 minutes left. I wondered if uh, how easy it is to like add an entirely new subcommand. 
Um, I don't really have a great practical example, but you know, we could think of a silly one. Like uh, if we just run this thing with like a say hello and it does. Yeah, yeah, well, sure. That it's actually happen. pretty easy. Uh, so here we have uh, in the definition, we use directly the sub command from SCCLI. What you want to do in, in a, to extend the sub command is actually define a new enum sub command. I'm going to delete this one. And we have a variant base. Again, I, I call it base because it's uh, easier for me to remember, but you can call it whatever you want, doesn't matter. And that one will have, uh, we'll use a CCLI subcommand. And then we have our new command, uh, hello world. And that one will that one will be a uh, yeah a hello world command actually we will need to define it so let's say I have a new command hello world voila and here yeah that's good actually we use the our sub command that wraps uh, both of them. Um, yeah. So now what will happen here is that um, we need to match what subcommand we have here. So this one is um, is the subcommand base. But we also have the hello world one. Let's go with bombs. I didn't know about that macro. Is that like the same as panic or unimplemented or something? Uh, yeah, it it has been introduced recently to replace. Uh, well, to in addition to unimplemented, it's it's an alias to unimplemented actually. Okay. It's just faster to, to write, that's why they, they made it. But you, you see, or it's already compiling properly because it, it works already, actually. Mm -hmm. So here, in this case, I'm, I'm using the, the subcommand from the base. So I, I, can, I can actually use it in the, in the create runner. And here, I don't need a create runner because I'm just going to print something. So, um, But it's also possible to, to define all your command with the configuration and everything. Mm -hmm. So, what I'm going to do actually here is to say hello to params that name. Yeah. Oh. Name is private. Huh? Yeah. Almost perfect. Oh yeah, you can see on the other one. So it, yeah, okay. No, no, it's going to work. Actually, it's easier to add a subcommand. But actually, yeah, I already explained. So the, the the main reason why it's done that way is because in Rust you cannot just modify the struct of a, of a library or for, of a dependency that you have. So if you want to to add something, you have to to wrap it. So now if I run the command help, you will see that I have a new command. Uh, oh, I forgot to flatten this one. I wondered, yeah, do we have to like flatten or something to... Yeah, in this yeah, case okay. we need to flatten, otherwise the, the subcommand is base. That's not what you want. Oh, wow. So like can the way we did that before, before you flattened, can subcommands have subcommands? Yeah. Would it have yeah. Been like no template base purge chain or whatever? Yeah, you can oh, have okay. subcommand of subcommands. Okay. So I guess like if I wanted to add like three or four subcommands, you know, I could add them as more variants like you've done there, or I could make another enum that's like custom commands and put them all in there. And then the, the one that you have is just like flattens the substrate default one and flattens all of my custom ones. Yeah, you could do that, but you, you don't have to. You can put all your subcommands here one by one. It doesn't really matter actually. 
Yeah. Okay. But the reason I, I have to do it with the substrate one is because that's not our code. That's in the substrate library that like probably we downloaded from crates.io or something. Yeah, exactly. From a CCLI, yeah. So here I have uh, Bob. Yeah. Hello, Bob. Oh, cool. Oh, and if, okay, so that's not an option, I guess. So if you don't put the Bob, then it's going to give you a parts yeah, error. This one is po positional argument, actually. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, nice. Okay, cool. So, Cecile, I don't know if you want to talk about this or, or not. I know you've worked on Cumulus a little bit, and I, I wondered if looking at its, like, just even CLI is a good way to start to get, like, hints about the structure because I, I remember like this is kind of old at this point but i remember at some point you made a pr where it like um separated the commands that go to the like embedded polka dot node versus the commands that go to like the parachain node or yeah actually right now in cumulus it's not the best example because um uh we have some issue with the ports so there is a lot of boilerplate just to override the, the port Okay. Um, that is something I, I would like to fix. But if you go in Cumulus, you, you do have this example where um, you can start the, the command, use the dash dash to say, okay, that's the end of the, the, the parameters for my, uh, for my parachain. And then you have other commands here, other parameters that will be passed to, um, to the relay chain. Because in the case of Cumulus, you have two nodes running. So we parse two times the, the command line argument, one for the parachain, one for the relay chain. So Cumulus is a good example for that, but it's a really specific use case also maybe. And uh, in Polkadot, the example is a bit uh, cleaner because uh, we just extend things. So if I look at uh, CLI, src comments and yeah here we have uh, extended the sub comment so we have the yeah we have also extended the run cmd because you, you can run kusama or uh, polkadot So th this one has also a nice customization. It's a good example if you want to, to see how to how to run two type of different nodes uh, with a single CLI. Oh yeah, I see in there like like in, in our UTXO one that we've looked at a lot, you know, this was a little more straightforward, but now I see like on line 85, if you're calling one run, run node with one set of parameters and 91, you're calling run node with like, I guess it's whether you're doing Kusama or West End or Polkadot mainnet. Yeah, exactly. So here it's actually changing only the uh, type parameters, the runtime API, the executor, depending on uh, if it's Kusama or if it's West End, but that has been added recently. <laughs> yeah. You didn't see that. And for the subcommand, you have the same thing. You see, you have subcommand base, which is the base subcommand of substrate. And for uh, for the new subcommand that has been added for uh, Polkadot, you have a, a different variant. And this one is like the hello world that we did. It just initialized the logger, and then it does things directly. But you have also this benchmark one, which is using the runner. And when you use the runner, it it in, it makes a a runtime uh, for your uh, async IO, uh, async stuff. Yeah, nice. But yeah, in this case, it's not using the async. It's using synchronous code. The only reason we use a runner here is to use the, the configuration. Okay, cool. Well, next week, uh, next week we're going to talk more details about the UTXO chain that we looked at a little bit today. We'll talk all about the runtime and how the UTXOs work and how the proof of work works and, and that kind of stuff. So I'm glad we got to preview that a little bit. And I'm also selfishly glad that I had this chance to ask Cecile for help with our UTXO chain. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for that. <laughs> yeah, I hope it was um, helpful and uh, it will be hopefully easier for you to uh, define, to make new CLI with uh, this API. And uh, don't hesitate to send me feedback if you 
if you find something uh, weird or something that could be better. For sure. Okay, cool. Well, thanks a lot, everybody, for attending, and especially thanks to you, Cecile, for the, the demo and the lesson. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Yeah, thanks. Cool. thanks. Thanks.